just interviewed. Uh, I just interviewed a uh, a guy today for uh, a position for one of my clients. Uh, on his resume, he you know all caps lean, all caps Kanban, all you know like he's he's throwing these words out there. Uh, my advice to you guys as students is to really learn as much as you can from a textbook standpoint, because when you get out there in the in the in the real world, so to speak different people have uh morphed some of these definitions morphed some of these terms and and morphed some of these applications so it's uh it, it's it, it's it's uh unsettling at times because uh a lot of people have uh the wrong connotation of lean or the wrong definition of lean and they have bad experiences uh of lean and so it's uh it, it makes it for a challenge for implementers like uh like us yeah you, you know mike and that's one of the things too we've, we've added to this class probably since the last time you talked to these guys we um added on the the shingo model huh yeah which is you know sort of fundamental okay yeah there's all kinds of tools and things but these are sort of the fundamental principles Yep. that we're trying to get and maybe they might be a little different or you know um have you know slightly different edges to them in your particular situation but um i i uh yeah i and that's that's fantastic that you do that and i commend you for doing that because there is a standard right uh you know i, I make the joke about six sigma being variation reduction but there's a ton of variation out there in the uh in the training so <laughs> i have to to kind of walk the line between being a uh, an implementer, uh, a change agent, and a um, uh, and, and an instructor, and so and I'll use I'll use an example as I have a client that uh, they that they use this uh, so it's all caps it's T A K, and uh, you know it took uh, I don't know maybe a couple days for me to to understand what they were talking about uh and so again they morphed tact t-a-k-t into yep. uh all caps t-a-k they call it talk and they're they're using it for cycle times so mm -hmm. uh right so i want to correct them uh and, and i kind of you know told them but they you know they haven't changed so uh so yeah, with with small businesses, uh, that's that's mostly the challenge because uh, you have folks that are trying to to do what they're passionate about, uh, which is not lean. It's whatever their their business is, uh, but they've you know they they hear these things uh, about lean and stuff that they're trying to uh, to implement, and they you know sometimes do it in uh, weird ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they miss mark. You know, you know, it's interesting. That's also, um, you know, one of my pet peeves is when when people use tack time and cycle time incorrectly, and and you, you just, you know, but but they're learning, right? They're they're they're, they're trying. At least they're doing something, right? We talked. I talked a little bit about time being this yep. this super metric. So so as lean practitioners, you know, I, I tend to gravitate towards looking at the time first, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's okay what's going on with the time in this situation because i know if i can get a handle on that i can i can really affect so many things yep uh one of the other things that uh, that i wrote down as you were talking is one of my favorite sayings and i actually used it today uh which i guess isn't that uncommon uh but don't let perfect get in the way of better uh -huh. and uh what we're talking about is a an assembly area uh, it's a complete disaster. We're going to put up some shelves, uh, and it's not going to be perfect, uh, but it's going to be a whole lot better than uh, than it was. A lot of folks uh, are hesitant to make changes or implement changes or uh, do do anything different because it's not perfect. And the saying is, "Don't let perfect get in the way of better." So if we can make things better, then you adjust. So yeah. that's what PDCA is uh, is all about, right? Right, right. So good. Well, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna encourage our students to go ahead and and ask you some questions. And, and I don't know, you know, Mike, if you'd sort of be uh, uh, open to you know some on the on the fly consultations. You heard some of us 
some of these students are, are got got pro every one of these students has a different project that they're trying to trying to work on and fix and and you've done a, a world of fixing and on different problems so uh, I, I was so glad that i was muted when your your three students were talking because i was like oh you got to do this oh check this out oh you know like uh the the for the restaurant one uh you know uh look up on youtube the seinfeld uh soup episode yeah because that's the other extreme uh of uh of what uh, she's dealing with so yes absolutely ask me anything <laughs> okay well, well it looks like we got some takers for you so um let's see hey hey um kaylee do you want to you want to handle the answers i'm having a little trouble with my uh my mouse and screen manipulation here so I've got uh, I've got some uh, some names are obscured here. So Kaylee, you want to go ahead and call in a person? Yeah, um, sure. Uh, Sarah, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. Hi there. Um, you just talked about tack time, and this kind of relates to it. But one of the things that we're going to be focusing later um, these coming weeks is uh, learning about line balancing. So aligning capacity with demands to meet the customer needs. So I was wondering if you have done that recently in your job, if you could talk a little bit more about that and how it's applicable and what tools you've used to kind of visualize it as well. Uh, have I done it recently? Uh, I showed up with my client about 10 hours ago and uh, one guy was out sick. So I had to go from a four person line and, and then there was another guy doing something. Else. I had to go from a four person line to a two person line. Uh, same line, same expectations. Uh, somehow we pulled it off. Uh, so, you know, what, what have I used? Um, just measuring cycle times. Okay. One of the, uh, I'll, 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 I don't, I don't, I, don't know, I, I could go on for hours, as Eric knows. Uh, one of the problems with uh, with measuring cycle times is uh, is is simply people know that they're being measured. So uh, I've been to clients and they think I'm playing on my phone, but I'm actually timing them, uh, and they you know they don't even know. Uh, and it's I'm not trying to be manipulative to them or anything else. I know psych psychologically they're going to speed up when they know that they're being timed. So uh, the the best thing I think the best thing to do is uh, just observe if so. So we have uh, at this place, it's it's kind of a, a like it's a T cell. So you have two sub assemblies coming into three uh, assembly stations, right? So it looks like a T, right? You got two coming in and then going down uh, when when the last person moves it and puts it into the box. And just at that moment, the, the next person puts it onto the test stand. And just at that moment, the next person puts it, you know, into station number two, uh, then, you know, you're balanced. When there's a, a, a lack of inventory in a certain area, you know that you're not balanced because not everybody's working at the same pace. So that's where you start putting buffer inventory in. Uh, and starting to get you know kind of kind of more complicated, but the the biggest thing to do is just watch, be you know be the the best observer that uh, that you can, and uh, see how different people react to different things. The the biggest problem with line balancing, uh, if you're not dealing with machines and you're dealing with people, is that there's variation. Yeah. Not everybody goes at the same pace throughout the day every single day and you have to you have to accept that so thanks sir and, and, Thank and you know, just, yeah I was, I was just gonna say you know just sort of help out they also um recently watched the movie the goal right oh good so yeah. part of the balancing of you know at least start out by knowing what your bottleneck is or, uh -huh. or what the worst case thing is and you know trying to get everybody else you know or, or get that bottleneck down and, uh -huh. and Sort of spread that work out evenly over the line yep. is a big, big factor in line balancing. Take you a long way, right? Okay, Kaylee. Okay, we have another question from Skyler. Hi, I was just wondering, um, what improvements did you make at the sports equipment place that you're talking about? <laughs> uh, last week, I uh, <laughs> I completely changed the layout. 
uh, of the uh, assembly area. Uh, one of the things that I have to deal with because it's in Los Angeles County is uh, COVID stuff uh, and spacing and whatever else. So, uh, so that's like an added challenge. Uh, I did a, an inventory, um, I, I did a pallet layout. I know that in the next six weeks, there's 59 pallets coming in. Uh, this is not a very big warehouse. That's probably three times more than, uh, than they, they even can fit and they're full now. Uh, so having, so here, let, let me, let me put it this way, right? So if we look at concentric circles, okay, I love doing this. <laughs> so if, uh, if we have a small circle, right? So th that it's not going to show up too well. Uh, the small circle, that's the process. Okay. If we go to the next circle, that's the material. The material flow, right? All the material has to, to flow into the process. And if we go uh, one more deeper, it's the information. So information flow, material flow, process flow. So I started in the, the, the process. Uh, I've only been there for three weeks or so. Uh, I've, I'm working out into the material side. Uh, and then I'm going to start going into the information side, which is um, kind of what I started doing uh, this afternoon. So uh, I mean, I can get into specifics and stuff, but uh, it's it, it's all uh, looking at uh, problems, prioritizing those problems, and uh, then you know working towards uh, coming up with the right solutions for the big picture and sustaining those solutions. So I'm also an OSHA trainer, and so on the safety side of things. So when I came in originally, I was like, all right, here, you know, here are a couple of OSHA things that we need to fix. So safety is always a, uh, uh, a big thing in, in my mind. So mm -hmm. I know that didn't answer your question specifically, but uh, hopefully it's, it helps. No, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Scott, were you, were you uh, interested in something specifically? Like, what would you think that, you know, somebody would work uh, or, or would be sort of the issue in a sports layout? Or yeah, that's kind of what I was wondering. I, I was just sort of curious on like what could be the problem to fix there. I mean, like I guess the other ones you were talking about was like the surfboard uh, materials and like the dog kennel place. But yeah, the the sports one kind of caught my mind. Yeah, it, you, you would think that it's. <laughs> I don't want to be jaded when uh, when I say this, but whether I'm making sports equipment or uh, raviolis or uh, I don't know, record players. Uh, it, it's, it's all kind of the same stuff. You have, you have a process, you have material, you have information, right? If, if you keep that in mind, uh, that can really kind of put it into perspective. Now it's nice to have a passion uh, about it. I had a, a, a customer brought in a return and he's like, hey, how does this work? And I'm like, I have no idea. I've, I've never worked what, with one. Uh, you know, I'll get one of the guys that does, but I know how to make them. I know what materials go into them, but uh, never really uh, did that. So uh, uh, I did work in one place that uh, we, we did aerospace. Uh, so we did the, uh, the controls for helicopters and airplanes. Uh, I fly, I flew helicopters in the military. I still fly helicopters, but I was in a sales position uh, in, as an employee in that company. And so the engineers would come to me every once in a while and I'd have to say, hey, are you asking me as a pilot or are you asking me as the, the, sales, uh, the sales guy? Mm -hmm. So perspective is, uh, uh, is, is always important. But if you can do something that you, you know, is fun and passionate about, then that's, you know, that's even better. You, you know, Mike, I, I really like your sort of three concentric circles model. I think that's sort of real useful. One of the models that I use is, and I've talked to the students about is I go into a situation and say, okay, what's the value? What's the process? And then how are we engaging the people in problem solving, right? And I think, you know, between those, like your, your model and the, the value process people sort of thing, you know, th these are simple sort of ideas that you just need to sort of bring into play. And and then you need to think and work through it, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's funny, I talked about the three piece today with uh, that interview, so. 
Yeah, well, it sounds like we're, we're hitting on a lot of the same stuff and the students are, are starting to get a feel for that. Hey, um, so, um, uh, well, let, let me ask you, so, so I'm going to jump down to the question, like, you know, to ask you to share, like, one of your greatest lean successes or failures and, and what you learn, because, you know, lean folks are always learning from the, from the successes and the failures. So, um, well, we kind of go with that. Yeah, and and I, I, I knew you were going to ask that question. Uh, I want to share a failure, and I think it ties in with uh, some of these other things. Uh, and it was a, a small company that said, hey, we want to implement SPC. Uh, I know you guys haven't gotten SPC yet, but nonetheless, uh, I want to imp implement statistical process control. And I said, OK, what's the problem? And they said, well, we don't have SPC. <laughs> Right. And uh, and so a a solution, right, isn't the problem and identifying the problem very early on, uh, clearly identifying the problem, writing a problem statement is uh, is so crucial because people want to jump to conclusions. And if you haven't seen Office Space uh, and the jump in, jump to conclusions, Matt, you can go to that video. But uh, the so the, the failure there, there were two failures here. One is that the business owner already had a solution in mind, not knowing what the problem was. The other problem was that the business owner didn't want to change the way that they were doing things. So having, uh, having somebody open to change is, uh, is, is crucial to the success of Lean. And, uh, you know, if, if you change requires change, right? Here's a real philosophical saying, change requires change. So if you want to improve your productivity, if you want to improve your efficiency, if you want to improve your cycle time, whatever it is, in, in, increase your profits, right? If you want to make some sort of change to an output, you have to change the inputs. And so when people are closed minded to change, even though they say that they want to change, uh, there's a there's a again a people aspect to to this business. You guys as students, you guys can learn the tools all day long. It's the soft skills that are going to make you successful because you have to deal with people. So uh, hopefully that's uh, hopefully that answers your question and hits home a little bit. Yeah, no, it definitely hits home for me. Um, so I'm going to ask you any any other questions at this point. For Mike, really? No, that's disappointing. There's 30 people in here. <laughs> oh, there we go. Kaylee's gonna help us out. Kaylee, yeah, um, help. I'm not a student, but I have a question. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, like, um, having worked with so many different companies, um, have you? Do you see like a common problem across all these different industries? Uh, I will. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and I'm not laughing at your question. I'm just laughing at the, my experiences. Uh, one of the tools, and I don't know if you cover this, Eric, but one of the tools that I've been using recently, maybe the last five or six years, uh, so much is a swim lane process map. Hmm. Do you teach that? Not, not directly. We, okay. we, teach, we teach mapping in general, but yeah. All right. So, uh, and, and I'll explain why. Uh, people, um, don't have the big picture of things. They don't have it documented. And the, the flow of information, the flow of material, whatever it is, uh, you know, whatever type of business you're in, uh, they don't have, they, they, they think they have it all up here. And they think that they know it. So there's, there are three versions of any process, uh, what you think it is, what you want it to be, and what it actually is. And so when getting into mapping and stuff, it's important to, uh, to get the one that it actually is, not the one you think it is. So the common problem to answer your question is uh, that visibility of the, the process. Mm -hmm. And at, you know, physically writing it down and documenting it so that, uh, so, so that it's tangible. What's up? Yeah, it's going to be the one for sure. So, <laughs> we, got, we got some. Let me just, there we go. We're just 
Does that answer your question? So the again, the tool isn't the, the problem. Uh, the, the problem is visibility. Uh, a swim lane process map helps to um, divide that flow chart information. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have two more questions. We have um, Mayor Peck. Can, sorry about that. Uh, no, no worries at all. Um, my question was about your uh, military background. I was wondering if that has helped you or has given you an advantage in the uh, lean industry because, you know, uh, one common sense about military that is that things are supposed to be on time and efficient. Now, I just wanted to get your um, sort of feedback on that as well. Yeah, 1000%. Uh, Eric said that I have 17 years of lean experience, but throw the military stuff in there and it's a whole lot longer. Uh, and so, and so I started off in the military uh, doing demolitions. Uh, and so I'm on the ground with small group of, uh, of folks and um, blowing stuff up. Uh, I then transition into uh, aviation and now I'm flying helicopters and, you know, kind of controlling, you know, a bunch of different stuff uh, going on. So uh, I really feel like I had kind of the two extremes of uh, leadership. Uh, I was also in from 2000 and 2008 and nothing really happened then. So uh, I, I feel like I had the like the two extremes of leadership. Uh, and that has helped tremendously because again, I'm dealing with people, I'm dealing with teams. I don't typically go into places and, and I say typically, cause I, I have done it, but I don't typically go into places and work independently. They don't put me in a corner and say, Hey, go, you know, go fix this, go solve this problem. Uh, I have to work with the folks and I have to work with every level of the organization. And so the military also helped me there because I was, you know, I was a, a junior officer briefing, uh, you know, two and three star generals uh, on on stuff. And so, uh, along with, you know, you know, leading uh, eighteen year old folks. So, uh, so that has definitely helped. Now, the the other piece that I add to that is that the military doesn't formally do lean. And they do a little bit of lean training here and there, but if you look at you know just general stuff that uh, that they do, you know having things on time, having cycle times, having visual management, right? All those things are lean tools. So I, I don't care if you call it lean or not; it's still uh, it's you know it still makes sense. So thank you. I appreciate the feedback. Okay, then Adrian. Hi, Michael. Thanks for coming in to speak to us today. Um, my question kind of piggybacks off of Kaylee's. Um, it sounds like you've worked in a, <clears throat> a wide array of um, experiences with different businesses and companies, whether small or big. So my kind of question was, have you noticed any really prevalent similarities or differences among small or bigger companies? And which one might be harder to work with or easier in your experience? Yeah. Uh... I'm going to give you the answer that I hate getting as an instructor. It depends. So uh, I've been in big organizations where change is just uh, like the, the hardest thing to do. It's like turning a cruise ship uh, versus small organizations where, you know, uh, they, they went on break and I just moved the, uh, the assembly station uh, 180 degrees. Right, I can just I can do things very uh, very quickly and don't need a whole lot of uh, stuff. I've worked in union shops where uh, they wouldn't they were too busy to to bring a new workstation that had two levels. So uh, my fellow black belt and I uh, stayed late one night, and uh, amazingly they came in the next day and the workstation was there with the two levels. Right, so there are challenges. Oh, and then go back to my other example of the uh, the business owner that had so much control that uh, that they that you know he just didn't want to change. So it it really depends on the atmosphere and the culture that uh, that you're you're going into, and uh, and what the problems are. Uh, I've gone into places and it's like, well, hey, you know, we got this gigantic problem. And I'm like, all right, well, we're not going to solve that in the next two years. 
uh, go back to uh, the DoorDash uh, student problem that said, hey, the, the restaurant's too far away. Well, again, you're not going to solve that, right? You have no control uh, over that. So sometimes uh, folks, business owners and stuff feel like I'm a, uh, I don't know, like uh, better, better than I am when, uh, you know, when they come with some of their problems. Uh, you know, they come with, I don't want to say impossible problems, but problems that I don't have the, uh, the control over. And so, uh, so there are good things and bad things. Uh, when I work with a, a two or three or four person company, maybe they don't have the money to buy the, the right equipment. Uh, that that they need versus a larger company that has a huge budget and you know I, I can go off and do whatever I want with it so it, it really depends on the situation the atmosphere and the culture let's let, let's say these are the last last two questions oh, like Eric that. I'm having too much fun you know I know you are <laughs> <laughs> okay so first up um Benium uh, this isn't a lean question, but I was just curious about what kind of helicopter you flew. CH-47 Chinooks. Uh, the, the dumpster with the two palm trees. <laughs> yep. The fastest helicopter in the military. Yeah. Very cool. And so, so it j just a one minute answer on that one. Uh, it's not a traditional helicopter that has the anti-torque um, rotor in the back. Uh, it has a tandem rotor in the in the top. So one of my buddies was over in in my garage last weekend, and he saw pictures posters of it, and he was he was asking me uh, how difficult of a transition is it from a traditional ro helicopter to a tandem uh, helicopter. Uh, and th yeah, the aerodynamics are different, the controls are different, right? Everything's different, but. In general, it's still a helicopter. I'm still, you know, doing vertical takeoffs and landings, and I'm, you know, I'm still flying places. So, uh, it's like getting into maybe a stick shift car or, you know, standard automatic, uh, standard transmission car versus an automatic transmission car, right? Just have to learn a little bit things. Mm -hmm. Same thing in in uh, lean implementation. You're walking into different situations. You have to be flexible. Okay, and last question is Sunni. Um, yes, um, this is a lean question. <laughs> okay, um, thank you so much for joining us today. I wanted to ask, you said something about not letting perfect get in the way of better, and that sort of stuck me. Um, so my question would be, do you ever settle? So um, since lean is so customer focused, and if the customer is okay with better, but you know they can get perfect if you push them a little bit, do you just settle for, what they want, even though you know they have potential for better or for you know something better than that. Uh, I'll I'll give you the most honest answer uh, that I can, uh, and it may not come across the right way, but depends on the paycheck. So, uh, what effort is it going to take to continue to improve? Right? What cost? At what cost is it going to take them? If it's because because I'm not cheap. Uh, so if, if it's going to take me, you know, this much longer to get this much improvement, I'll be honest with them and say, Hey, it's probably not worth the investment right now. Uh, I also like to stabilize. So there's a, there's an old, um, there's an old thing. It says, uh, Kaizen, right? So you go up a step, you, you stabilize, you go up a step, you stabilize, you go up a step, you stabilize, right? It's not, uh, necessarily a gradual slope. So it's good sometimes to, to allow the process, uh, you know, allow the dust to settle a little bit. It gives you better clarity on uh, if that change actually worked. Uh, I was talking with somebody earlier and, uh, hey, this week I'm going to do this. The next week I'm going to do that. And I'm going to keep changing these things each week. And, and I, I told her, hey, you know, maybe you don't want to do that necessarily because you don't know what that impact is. So understand the impact of the change before moving on to the next step. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Well, well, well thanks. Well, Mike, I, I think we're gonna have to yeah. wrap it up at, at this point. You pack so much into this. Uh, <laughs> You know, th 30 or so minutes that we've talked, I, I really sort of appreciate it. 
I, I think the other thing I want to point out too to the students, and I thank you for this, is, is kind of the passion and excitement that you bring to this field. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons I like to work in this field is because of people like you. So, so, so thank you for that. And, and you have, I, I think you have to be passionate about it because you're working with folks that, uh, you know, hey, they, maybe they don't want to change. Maybe they don't know what the solution is, but they know what the problems are. And so listen to the folks and, you know, try to solve problems. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's always a blast. I wish I could do it more often, but yeah. uh, you, you see why. So good to see you. Thank okay. you guys and good luck. Thanks everybody. Turn on your videos. Give us a little wave. It's a great way to end the video too. So thanks. Uh, thanks, Michael. We'll see, we'll see you around. Absolutely. Take care.